Yes, I see a nod, yes. Um, so again, welcome to our first virtual town hall. We're um, working with Zoom technology to try to um, identify some, some different and better ways to connect with people and keep everyone informed about what's going on. Um, for the purpose of this meeting tonight, uh, we are gonna mute everyone. Um, just that helps prevent feedback and it helps make the quality of the, um, the sound better for everyone. We, if you are online with Zoom, there is a chat function which you can use to uh, um, submit questions. And we are monitoring those questions. And if we have time, we will get to any questions that you submit. Um, if you do not have a computer, um, you know, if you're not looking at this online, um, you can email me. Um, we will be posting on Facebook my email address if you have questions or issues that you want to raise or things that um, weren't clear that you want to get to. Um, I think that's all on the technology. Jane, did I, did I forget anything? No, I think you're good. We're ready to go. All right, good. Jane is Jane Canale is our, our tech whiz and our moderator um, on this. So thanks for uh, coordinating this, Jane. So I, I want to start out um, by first acknowledging our, our staff, our direct support professionals, um, our administrators. This has been an unprecedented time. It's been an incredible challenge. And the Schenectady ARC workforce has been tremendous in the way they've responded. Um, and again, it's been from at every level and every, every department of the agency has flexed, has adjusted. Um, we back in March when this started, we had to redeploy, uh, you know, people from every program. We had to try to figure out how to support people in the community as well. Um, and the staff have been incredible. Um, I also want to thank the families. Um, you, our families have um, been through an incredible, incredibly challenging time, a stressful time. Um, and you've had to deal with slow communications or, or no communications at times while we tried to figure out what was going on. Um, the families have been great. They've, you know, people have raised issues with us when they've had them, um, but they've also um, been very generous and thankful and, and we appreciate that. So um, my goal tonight is to just, is to talk a little bit about um, the coronavirus, talk some about our response to it, to talk about some of the issues that are still out there, some of the reopening issues dealing both with the residential programs and with the day programs. Um, I also, I wanna to touch on um, the fiscal impact of this and some of the issues connected with the state budget. Um, and then I'm gonna end on, on some good news. I think, you know, just some of the, some highlights of some of the, because every day we've got good stories, we've got positive stories. So, we, you know, we don't wanna forget those. And I don't want to. I won't, don't want to leave on a negative note. Um, so I want to start out just by talking briefly about the virus, the coronavirus, and how it's impacted us. Um, we have, I think, many of you know, we operate 21 different residential houses. We operate um, over 20 apartments, supported apartments throughout the community. Um, we have our work programs and our day programs. We have had. Um, a number of cases of the coronavirus in our houses, um, in different houses. We have had a number of instances where our employees have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. We've been working since the start of this with the, the local health department. And for those of you who live in Schenectady County, um, we can be really proud of the work they're doing because they, they've been tremendous for us to work with. Um, but it's not just the local health department that we answer to. We have to respond to OPWDD. We have to respond to um, the State Department of Health and in some cases, federal guidelines. Um, we are working, uh, a lot of the juggling that we've been doing is trying to make sure we're complying with all the different requirements. Um, we are continuing to take all the steps that we can to keep the people we support safe, to keep um, our employees safe, and to still offer um, the services and the supports that people need. Um, I think everyone knows, but it's, it's worth reiterating, this happened in mid-March. Um, 
on March 13th, we announced that we were going to be closed on the following Monday because that day, just about every school district in the capital district announced they were closing. Um, we knew that was going to have an immediate impact on our ability to staff our day programs. Um, so we took a one day break to say, all right, let's assess the situation. Um, we quickly determined that it was in the best interest of everyone if we um, ceased operations. And at that point we were saying, well, it's gonna be a two week period of time so we can assess where we are and what we need to do. Um, you know, when we think back on that time frame and what we were thinking, we were um, either incredibly naive or incredibly optimistic or, or maybe both um, that this situation would be addressed in two weeks. Um, two days after we decided to close the state of New York directed that all day services be closed. Um, and that direction remains in place today. Um, I'm gonna to talk in a few minutes about how, what we're doing in spite of that. Um, but we developed um, plans that week to look at um, how do we support people who are living in our residences? How can we support families who have people at home? Um, and since the start of the crisis, and you know, many people may not know this unless you are a family supporting someone who's living at home, we've had our day staff reaching out, um, asking families, are, you, are there things you need? Can we help you in any way? Um, and we are gonna continue that outreach. Again, that kind of outreach is gonna be critical for planning for the future, which I, again, I'll talk about in a few minutes. But that started um, really immediately um, in addition to the, you know, that outreach to people who live in the community, we redeployed many of our residential staff or our day staff to our residences because obviously our residences were now operating on a 24-7 basis. So that was the day services. That's what happened. That had, you know, we serve um, close to 300 people in our different day programs, obviously had a significant impact across the region. Um, residentially, we, I think that same week or maybe the following week, re, we received direction from OPWDD that people living in our residences could not leave the residences um, to visit with family, to go away for a weekend or a week. Um, if people did leave the residence, the direction from OPWDD was that um, they would have to stay with family for the duration of the emergency. Um, so that was the no, the no leave policy. Um, at about the same time, OPWDD announced a no visitors policy that um, certified sites like our houses and our apartments could not have any visitors um, except for staff or essential medical personnel. Um, this created a lot of challenges for a lot of people. Families had to decide. Um, you know, many families and, and, and I am one of them have regular routines where you, you plan to see um, somebody who's getting supports in a house or an apartment. You've got a, a weekend routine, a weekly routine, um, and all of that was thrown, you know, into a mess as a result of both the a result of the virus and really, you know, trying to develop safe practices, but also as a result of the mandate from OPWDD. Um, and that, you know, we've been operating under those restrictions since late March, you know, that third week in March is when those, those directives came down. Um, so, you know, I think everyone has heard um, the governor just announced today, I think um, hospitalizations in New York dropped below a thousand um, for the first time since, you know, sometime in April. Um, the New York State has been on a very positive trajectory, you know, good trajectory as far as its response to the coronavirus and its handling of the illness. Um, unfortunately, we're not seeing the same thing in some of the southern states. And again, I'm sure people have heard the, um, the governor announced today restrictions um, for individuals who are traveling to New York from targeted states um, have to quarantine for a 14 day period of time. Um, that's another mandate that we now have to figure out how that affects our employees who may be traveling and returning. Um, but the 
I, the, the point I think that I want to make is, you know, as New York has done better and as New York has looked at opening up, um, OPWD has not changed their restrictions. They've not changed their guidelines until actually until late last week. So the first sort of the crack in the wall that OPWDD has um, has shown or has demonstrated is they said um, and they announced at uh, the governor's press conference that they would start allowing visitation under guidelines to be issued by OPWDD. Excuse me, I have to. Um, so with the uh, with that announcement, we developed that the uh, guidelines were issued last Thursday, just a week ago, we developed um, guidelines and we have a process in place for allowing people to visit individuals who are at our residence. Um, we started that at the beginning of this week and um, we will be putting those guidelines out on the, uh, we'll post them on our website. We'll post a link to that on the Facebook page. Um, the general requirements are guidelines that, you know, I think people are familiar with from dealing with stores and, and other places. Um, people need to call in advance to schedule the visits. We are scheduling visits only in outdoor spaces so that we can be assured of adequate ventilation and um, maintaining six foot social distancing. We are asking people to wear masks for the visit. We are doing symptom checks and temperature checks before people come. We are logging. It's a fairly extensive set of requirements, um, but again, this is the first um, step that the state has taken in allowing us to open up our programs a little bit to return to something closer to normal than we've been experiencing and living with for the last, really the last two and a half months. Um, so that, um, again, those guidelines will be posted. That is available for families, and we're glad that we're able finally to, to expand things a little bit. Um, that does not address the, um, the issue of people leaving our houses. Um, it, if, and OPWDD has not relaxed that restriction at all. And again, this is very frustrating. I've been, I'm involved with provider calls and provider associations and, you know, people have made the point that many other, I'm sure you've all thought of, if, if people can, um, you know, staff can come in, you have different people in, um, why, why can't family come in with some safeguards in place? That I think is the next step that we're pushing for with OPWDD is to um, develop some, some, um, checks and some systems where people could go on safe outings with family members. Um, so that's where we are residentially. Um, and again, we don't have any timeframes from OPWDD on when new policies might be implemented or new changes might be put in place. Um, we will do our best to let everyone know what we're planning and what we're working on. Um, day services. Um, and I, I hope many of you received the letter that I sent out just addressing in general the um, situation we have with our day services. Many families are, are really frustrated. You know, I think at the start of this, people thought we can do this. It's, it'll be a short period of time, but it'll be over. Um, it hasn't been a short period of time. It, you know, the, the order for closure continues. Um, and again, we don't have an option on this right now. Um, when we closed our day services, we were um, directed to submit a plan saying, well, you know, how were we going to help people? What were people going to do? And for people who were in our residences, that was easy. We were going to support them in our residences. For people who lived at home, we were doing call-ins, checking in with families, um, and you know, we have made some efforts in extraordinary circumstances to provide additional supports. Um, we actually encountered significant resistance from the state when we did try to um, develop some of these ways to help people. Um, our experience to date has been that the state is very conservative and very reluctant to allow anything that looks like our traditional day services to restart. We are anticipating that 
when day services resume, um, it will look quite a bit different than it does than it did before March 13th. Um, the the idea, and you know, this is consistent with everything that's happening across the country and really across the world. The idea of a lot of people gathered in a you know in a relatively small space. You've got you know people in classrooms, people on buses. Um, it's just it's not going to be safe until there's a vaccine developed and until or there's effective treatments um, that can be used in the event of the, the transmission of the virus. So we are looking at, all right, if that old normal isn't going to be possible, if it's not going to be safe, what is the new normal going to be looking at? And we're working with our families. We developed a survey to send out to family members to assess what are families comfortable with? What are people looking for? Um, can people wear PPE, personal protective equipment? Um, can they understand and, and live with social distancing requirements? Um, so we're looking at the individuals. Um, we're trying to assess the level of need. There are some people who have a really high need for the structure and for the, the friendships and the relationships that are part of the day services. There are other people who, who did very well with a more relaxed schedule and staying at home. Um, in all likelihood, what we will look at based on our assessments is um, once, and again, it's all contingent on the state saying we can do this, is phased reopenings, identifying the people with the highest level of need and the lowest level of risk and identifying, all right, how do we support those individuals? How do we develop day services that meet their needs? Um, and then going to, you know, sort of the, the, the medium risk individuals, the medium need, you know, there are people who um, may have, may have a good alternatives and they may not have, um, you know, the, the necessity to get, you know, right back to a day program. They may be good where they are for a, another period of time. Um, and then looking at, you know, there may be high risk individuals who we just might not be able to serve in that congregate setting until there is an effective vaccine. In place. Um, so that's what we're doing right now is identifying people with other providers, a, a risk assessment tool um, that looks at both the level of need and it looks at the, um, the level of risk, both for the individual and maybe for family members or others who the individual might be exposed to. So that's um, what we are doing right now to plan for what we anticipate will be um, some kind of reopening permitted in the future. I know one of the things that's been frustrating for families is New York has been um, very articulate and careful to do their, um, their phased reopening with tying it to regions and tying it to um, you know, the, the occurrences and the hospitalizations within specific regions. Um, they have not done that with our services. What we have been living with is a, a flat blanket statewide restriction um, one of the things providers are looking at is, can OPWDD develop a more flexible approach? Could they look at tying maybe phased reopenings of day services to some of the other phases where they're allowing um, businesses and other operations to, to gradually reopen? So there is, I know this is frustrating for people. It's frustrating for us. It's frustrating for our employees. Um, because there are way more unknowns right now than there are knowns. Um, our goal right now is we are looking at, um, you know, how can we meet, um, best prepare ourselves, get the best information so that we are ready once we know what we can do to start implementing some more concrete plans. Another part of what we want to do and will we'll do, again, as soon as we know a little bit more, is um, invite families, advocates, um, to, and self-advocates to help us with that planning process, to help us shape what it is we offer and what it looks like as we move forward. So that's something that, um, and a forum like this, you know, for us, this is a, a trial of the technology to see is, is this a, an effective way to reach people um, and to talk with folks. We've got um, close to 40 people, which is great attendance. Um, and I know we've got a few groups of people watching here and there. Um, 
So that um, that's where we are with, with our planning for day services right now. I wanna just touch briefly on the fiscal impact of this um, pandemic and the crisis. Um, it has been significant for us and for agencies like us. Um, we are paid for the services we provide. We operate in what people call a, a fee-for-service model. If we provide a service like a day of a day program or a day of respite or a day of community habilitation, we get paid a certain amount for that. And we build a budget and we project our revenues based on what we expect we will be providing. Um, day services has shut down. Um, Many of our other programs, our supported employment programs, respite, our clinics, our um, comhab, they're not shut down per se, but they are seeing um, greatly reduced usage. So we've taken a significant hit on the revenue side, um, and we've taken a significant hit on the, the expense side as well. We've incurred tremendous costs for um, PPE, protective equipment, we may be able to get some of that reimbursed through uh, FEMA grants. Um, we've had hazard pay that we've paid people who've been working in situations where they are working directly with people with the virus. Um, the state has not yet said they will reimburse us for that. Um, so our goal with the, with the advent of the crisis and the shutdown was to keep as many of our employees employed as possible. Um, we've been incredibly successful with that. We've had opportunities for just about everyone um, who we employ. We, we, some people have not taken them. Some people have had personal situations due to the virus or due to their own um, health concerns, but we have been able to offer people opportunities. Um, and by and large, we have kept most of our workforce employed um, and at work. And as an essential business, we, um, you know, we were operating right through the pause and through most of the closure, as most of New York starts opening up, we're opening up more operations as well. Um, but our, again, I mentioned this at the beginning, our staff have done an amazing job. Uh, but we will, we are very concerned about um, the fiscal situation. And we just learned about two weeks ago that um, we are facing a cut um, to our residential program. Our residential program is our largest, um, you know, in terms of percentage of revenue. The, um, the residential cut that was announced um, limits our ability to, um, to have vacancies. It limits our ability to have people going home. Um, we just had a... Um, a link provided to us that individuals can use to go to OPWDD, to go to, um, actually not to OPWDD, to, but to um, your state senator, your state assemblyman, or the, uh, the governor, and just urge him not to implement these cuts. Um, and Jane, I don't know if you can share your screen and show the page that we will send out a link that will get you to this page. And this is a page that's sponsored by our parent organization, the ARC New York. Um, so the link takes you to this and all you have to do is fill in your personal information. Um, and if you can see the, the message on the left says that with one click, it will use your personal information and it will send an email directly to the governor, to the legislature and OPWDD asking not to implement cuts to our services, to our agencies in this time when we've had these um, incredible expenses that haven't been covered and we've had these challenges to our ability to generate revenue. Um, so it's uh, pretty easy. You, you fill in the information um, on the, at the bottom. There's a box where you can customize your message um, and say who you are, what your connection to our services is and why you're asking that um, these cuts not be made. And again, we appreciate any support um, that we can get uh, for our services, for our provider network. Um, the last thing I wanna say about the, um, the finances is the, um, in addition to the, the possible cut that OPWDD is talking about, 
I think everyone has heard that New York State is facing a significant revenue shortfall as a result of the virus and as a result of the chain, you know, the, the, just the, the pause and the economic shutdown that we've been living with for the last three months. Um, that sh that uh, shortfall in revenue gives the governor the power under the budget that was enacted, um, the ability to readjust the budget and to make even more cuts. So the, the cut that I just mentioned was part of the budget that was passed on April 1st, and it was passed um, before we really knew the full extent of the impact of the coronavirus and the, the shutdown and everything else. So we, there is still out there the possibility of further cuts. That depends almost completely on what the federal government does to help New York State. So if you see, um, you know, and, and just recently the House of Representatives passed, I think it was the fourth relief bill um, designed to help states, to help entities cope with the coronavirus. Um, that bill did not um, have any action in the Senate. So that's kind of where it stands is the Senate is due to act on it. Um, you know, the, the last things that I heard politically was that the Senate is not eager to provide more relief. Um, we'll see what happens if, if that gets taken up sometime in July. Um, it would probably be sometime after July 4th at this point. But that effort to support New York State is going to be critical, not just for us, but for school districts, for municipalities. Um, because again, the, the, um, the last I heard, it was $13 billion that New York State was short of projected revenue. Um, and unlike the federal government, the state has to balance its budget. It can't print money. It has to it can only spend the money that it has. Um, so we're already seeing impacts. We're seeing delays in payment, delays in rates being issued. Um, the, the federal assistance to the state um, is a critical part of keeping our system intact and functioning. So not a great um, financial picture, but it's, it's the reality that we are looking at and working with right now. <clears throat> um, so the last item that I want to talk about, um, and I'll just, again, I want to hit some high notes and end on some positive, um, positive items. One good news event or good news um, item was our, our Pine Ridge Industries. Uh, many of you know that we've operated Pine Ridge Industries. Um, it was what was, you, we used to call it a sheltered workshop. It was a work center for individuals with disabilities. Um, as a result of state mandates and changes in what individuals were looking for, Pine Ridge was converted from a, a sheltered workshop, a certified program site, to an integrated business, a business that has as its prime mission supporting individuals with developmental disabilities. But it also has an um, integrated business. It has, um, it has to have a, a mixed workforce and it has to basically function and survive as a, as a business operation. And we brought in this year, um, actually starting in December, uh, a new director, our chief operations officer at Pine Ridge, Nathan Monsager. Nathan came to us with a lot of experience um, working with different businesses in a slightly different capacity. Um, but Pine Ridge Industries, um, its primary contractor is an organization called Vista Labs. Vista Labs um, manufactures and sells plastic pipettes, the uh, little pipettes that you see in every commercial and every ad about um, the coronavirus research, coronavirus testing. They're used in labs, in colleges and universities, and in private labs um, across the country. Um, as you can imagine, the demand for that product skyrocketed um, in March and in April. It's tapered off a little bit now, um, but we were able to um, meet that demand. We've been a, a valued partner for them and um, Pine Ridge man manufacturing, you know, packaging and shipping a product that is essential to healthcare operations and essential to labs did keep functioning throughout the pause. Um, and they did a great job of trying to keep everyone safe. They um, really developed state-of-the-art techniques for monitoring worker safety, 
developing uh, you know, uh, spacing in the work floor, cleanliness standards in the work floor. Um, and they, um, they, they've done a, a, an amazing job and they, the, the workers there have been really proud to be part of the fight against the coronavirus. Um, that operation is, is making a positive contribution to our bottom line and uh, they're functioning at a better level than they have for several years. Um, so Pine Ridge Industries is definitely a bright spot. <clears throat> um, one other thing I want to mention, um, in, for the last three years, this was supposed to be our fourth year, we've had a food truck event in May. Um, this year, like everyone else, we canceled it. Um, this year we were set to have what was going to be the biggest and probably best event yet. We had worked with um, the casino to have space on their grounds right along the Mohawk River. We had a, a well-known country group, Skeeter Creek, set to play. We had, I think, 18 food trucks signed up. Um, all of that, of course, you know, got canceled. We had to refund deposits to food trucks. But the good news was all of our vendors, and almost all of our vendors, um, maintained their support of the organization, contributed what they had promised to contribute. Um, and, you know, that ended up being a real great positive development for our fundraising and development. And again, that's, um, that's money. It's not Medicaid money. It's not restricted money. It's money that we can use to help our operations, to help our employees, and to, um, to try to keep our, our services strong. So, there are some bright spots. I guess the, the last one I want to mention is um, we reached out to families and to friends. Our board supported us, um, donated gift cards to give out to our employees. Again, um, I can't stress how incredible our workforce has been. And you know, we were able to do raffles. We were able to um, do some giveaways. And we've been really pleased to, um, even though we are facing an extraordinarily challenging fiscal environment. We are able to devote um, as many resources as we can to supporting our employees. So um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm getting ready to wrap up my remarks and um, we're a little bit over a half an hour, but I'll turn to Jane and see what questions have come through on the chat line in a second. Um, I want to thank again our families for supporting us and um, I want to thank the um, our employees and again, I've, I hope this method of communication works. Um, I, you know, we're um, challenged to try to be able to reach people and to communicate with people. But um, let us know your comments. We are um, for people who are on the um, computer and who can see it. Jane, can you post my email um, information? So if you're on the phone and you're, you've got a pen handy, it's, it's pretty simple. It's Kirk L, K-I-R-K-L, at S-A-R-C-N-Y dot O-R-G. So um, if you have questions or issues um, that we don't get to or that weren't sufficiently addressed, um, please feel free to email me. Um, and I think, uh, Jane, I'll go back. Are there um, questions, items that came through the, the, the chat that you can you want to raise? Yeah, there are a couple. Um, one question was, when will the survey be distributed? The survey was mailed out um, last, I believe it was last week, the beginning of, um, at the beginning, so like a week ago this past Monday. So people should have, should have received it. And if you didn't receive it, um, please send me an email or send Jen Cole or your program director an email or let them know um, if you're a family um, and people are calling you, let them know you didn't receive the survey. Okay, and there was another question is, um, will the vaccine be mandatory? Um, that's a great question. And um, my guess from the rhetoric and the, the dialogue that we're hearing um, from the state and from different advocate groups around the state is that the state probably will make it mandatory. Um, 
I don't, I think we will be able to um, do some kind of phased reopening before we have a, a vaccine. Um, and, and again, I, you know, that's my, that's sort of my, my best guess. The other part of that though, is I think it's going to depend on, you know, what that vaccine looks like, um, how safe it is after it's trialed and how effective it is, um, whether or not that's going to be um, mandated for, for everyone. Okay, and then we had a number of questions about the visitation policy that may be more specific to the residential setting that maybe it would be better to speak directly with the residential director about the individual site. Okay, and our, our uh, again, that's um, OPWDD announced their guidelines at about four o'clock a week ago Thursday, and um, we developed the policy on um, Friday to get it ready to roll out on Monday. And we trained our directors, went through it with our staff on Tuesday and Wednesday. So it's, um, it's literally hot off the press. Um, we are, again, our goal throughout this has been, you know, both we have to comply with our guidelines and with the regulations, but we also are very concerned about safety. And, uh, you know, at, at the, you, you may agree or disagree with, you know, all the measures that are part of it, but the goal is safety and, and that is our goal as well. Um, so, yeah, if you do have questions, um, the, um, you know, please call your, the residential director. And if the residential director, you know, isn't able to answer the, um, the question that you have, email me or call me. Uh, okay, and there's one more about day programs. Um, if the family opts out uh, and opts to not send their loved one back to day program, do you think virtual services and supports like OT will still be available for individuals? Um, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, we are, um, one of the, the good things that's come out of this whole pandemic is we've learned that we can do effective, you know, for some people, um, telemedicine, telehealth, teletherapies can be very effective. Um, and we understand that there's people who may not want to go back to a congregate setting but they may want other supports and services. And part of what we are going to be asking families about is um, if in fact you're not comfortable or an individual is, is more vulnerable, what are the other ways that we can support people? And those um, remote technologies certainly um, would, be, would be one tool we would look to. The only thing that might impact that negatively is um, if the state says, all of a sudden you can't bill for those anymore. You can't, you know, that's not an acceptable service uh, modality. You have to do it face to face. Um, again, we learned um, the state very quickly said when the virus hit that they, they did away with some of the, the restrictions and rules around how those services were delivered. They authorized the telehealth. And I think the experience has been uniformly positive for both families and clinicians, maybe not uniformly, but generally positive, they is, it can be effective for many people. So yeah, we, we believe it would stay in place and we certainly will, will be advocating to keep it as an option. Okay, that is the bulk of the, the questions. We will go over them and Kirk can respond to individuals if there's additional information he can share, but I think that's it, Kirk. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Thank you everyone for your um, participation. I hope technically this, this worked for people. We, we welcome your feedback and um, we, will, um, we will stay in touch. We'll do everything we can to um, keep communication lines open. And thank you, Jane, for coordinating this um, from the State Street offices. All right. Take care. <laughs>